Hello, hello. <clears throat> hello, how are you doing? Hi. Let's see here. Let's start the first uh, uh, recording for the channel uh, Quantum Physics and Health and the Ambiguity channel. Uh, and I, I think it's better to start right ahead with a site. Uh, I don't know, Kalle, do you have that site from Bohr at hand? It would be nice if you could read it in that case. Yes, uh, I don't know which quotation you mean. Um, he, I, I, uh, this morning I read a book by David Bohm and David Pete entitled Science, Order and Creativity. And oh, I found I many like interesting quotations in this book. Um, for instance, um, <clears throat> um, so Bohr, so Bohm is discussing Niels Bohr. So David Bohm is discussing Niels Bohr. And in this book in, on page 81, uh, David Bohm uh, writes about Bohr. Bohr himself had emphasized that there is no meaning in talking about the existence of the electron, except as an aspect of the pattern of phenomena in which its observation takes place, end quotation. So in other words, there is no point of speaking about existence of something. There is no existence in Bohr's world, instead there is only observation. Well, that's, that's absolutely great, I think. Uh, it couldn't be put better in any way. And this also goes to show that means Bohr is the master of the words when he really puts his effort to it. To give uh, existence to anything would put another aspect, another property that's unnecessary. And it would also sort of, uh, what could you say, uh, not be proper it wouldn't be pure math it wouldn't be working physically because existence seems to be a philosophical concept and it's also something that is not observable existence is not something that you can perceive you can't see things that exist it's something extra and uh, that was later more specified by his son Augebor, who who also wrote about it uh, this, so to speak, misunderstanding how the world works. Uh, a physicist can never work with existence. It's, it's, it's not an observable thing. Uh, and it goes to say that this also applies to larger objects. It's not, it doesn't stop with the electron. Something that is a false assumption when it comes to the electron is probably, uh, I would say, also a false assumption when it comes to bigger things like chairs and <laughs> <laughs> and hats. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so we could apply this observation or this remark to Bohr and say, uh, like, it's pointless to say that I, Kalle, or you, Henrik or Haas, uh, you exist, or mm. even to say that I breathe or uh, that I'm running or something else. That's meaningless uh, things mm. to say in the end, yeah. what, is, what is significant is that I observe that you, Hans, are doing this or that, mm. or you, Henrik, are doing that or that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and interesting enough, that's uh, also the working of most, most non-Western languages. They don't have existence. It's a mm. very, very specific Western development to have existence. And it seems also, and this is to make it even more interesting, this has effects when it comes to cognition, how we perceive the world. It seems that uh, having objects in the language and in the uh, in the uh, in the philosophy in the in the existence world, it makes it more hard to observe things in the world. It makes us dull. It makes us not to perceive anything. It seems. Uh, that these phantom projections that we call uh, objects that destroy uh, experience somehow. 
Uh, and the difference is quite stunning when you compare Westerners to the indigenous people, but also Westerners to, to people uh, in Asia, for instance. It's a, it's a big difference. They perceive clearer. Uh, one, one example that's mentioned a lot of times in the book uh, by Ian McGilchrist is that if you take people and lead them to a room and uh, in the room you, you do some changes, you change uh, maybe the furniture, maybe the color of a painting, maybe the carpet, something like that. Uh, Westerners uh, are only one third as good as perceiving the differences uh, as people coming from Bangladesh. Uh, and that, those things are very interesting. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so it, it does have effects. Uh, we, we also talked earlier in this lecture series about how existence started somewhere. It was with the word Estean, I will remember, something like that. Uh, is that correct, Kalle? Yes, Estean in Greek or Ani, the infinity form. Ani, the infinity form. Yes, uh, so the Greeks uh, spoke about Ani, that is to be. And uh, that was their focus to be, and but that is that was not the point of view of Bohr. Miss Bohr, uh, he he thought it was um, it, it didn't help anything to speak about existence. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Any any points there, uh, Hendrik? Um, the spontaneous reflection is that it sounds like each individual has his or her uh, own uh, reality. Uh, so so what, what is the difference in, in this approach to, to, what is the difference from solipsism? Well, is it, is, is uh, it the same? Uh, no, 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 not at all. Uh, I, I would say maybe if Bohr was a philosopher, he would say, uh, existence would be solipsism because it, that's something uh, you only can produce yourself in your own head, so to speak. It's a construct. It's not from the world. But it's not even solipsism because you wouldn't be understandable to yourself uh -huh. what an object was. Okay, yeah. So it's, uh, so here we have the pr private language uh, uh, example here. So we, we can't say, I, I mean, solipsism would be only I exist. <laughs> well, only, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. So we, we are removing existence as, 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 a, as a concept as a whole. That would exclude even solipsism. Then. Yeah, it, well, I think it would exclude solipsism uh, because solipsism take you. You need a private language to be a solipsist uh, for one thing, and another thing is that existence doesn't make uh, any sense in any world. If you have a world with perceptions, uh, properties, uh, length, width, all those things, it, it doesn't make sense with the with the term existence. Uh, it doesn't help. It does. It does even cause a lot of problems because it's a construct it's not even a construct that makes sense it's it's just weird it's, it's it should go <laughs> mm. so so not even i exists well there's an i but it, it does it you cannot diminish it to be existence like not existence uh, Okay. You could say existence and non-existence is the same thing because it's a nonsense word or mm. it's, it's a word without meaning. Of course, there is an I. So I is not existence. I don't know if mm. that makes any sense. No, but, uh, <laughs> we are exploring right now. So I'm, I'm, but, but, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but from Bohr's point of view, it would be I observe. That makes sense. I observe. And yeah. therefore... Mm. And, and at the same time, I does not exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could say that. You could say that. That seems to be a prerogative, and not exist and to exist is almost like the superposition in some way. Superposition yeah. is the implicit world. Uh, uh, if uh, if you would have used uh, the uh, vocabulary of uh, uh, David Bohm, 
which Callum mentioned here from the book, uh, the very excellent book. It's a, it's a rather amazing book. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it came uh, in uh, the stream of books uh, that were published in the 70s, uh, The Tower of Physics and uh, uh, The Dancing Woolly Master by Gary Zucker. But it, it's completely different because it's a very scientific book. It's, it's grounded on uh, proper things and the proper physics. Uh, of course, David Bohm was an excellent physicist. So they, they are very, it's, it's a very different book. Although it was read by the same people in that era. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I think it was published in 1979, something like that. Isn't no, no, correct, no, 87, 87, 87. Ah, uh -huh, that late. Okay. okay. Uh, I don't follow. What what book was the quotation from? What was what was the name of the book? Science, order, and creativity. Science, order, and creativity from 1987, written by David Bohm and David Pitt together. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so it's, it's quite. Uh, yes. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Uh, so David Bohm speaks much about war. Uh, the, uh, the Danish physicist, and uh, he 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 backs him up, so to say. Uh, so so one of the other things that he said uh, that was important is that Bohr is Bohr. He said that uh, that the fundamental concepts must be ambiguous. In Einstein's view, they had to be unambiguous. A quotation from page 80, 84. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so it's interesting that um, uh, uh, we could apply this on, on observation. Uh, for Bohr, that will, would also be ambiguous, what he's seeing, really. But Einstein would not have accepted that. He wants that everything is clear cut, uh, what is observation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, that is extremely interesting because in this divide, you, you can say what properties belongs to the subject or what properties uh, exist in the object. Mm. And that's a little, little bit what happens in quantum physics, according to Bohr. Uh, he doesn't say it has to be a clear cut dividing line between subject and object that uh, I would assume Einstein meant it should be. But it's extremely interesting because uh, Bohr thought that uh, the same properties you find in the subject you can also find in the object. And so, <laughs> so, quite, so when we talk quite about uh, observe, I mean, observe in itself is me as a subject observe something, something outside. Right? Let, let, me, let me rephrase what I said or, or add something. I think in the eyes of Niels Bohr, observation was not unidirectional. It was not coming from one end to the other. It was also going from the object to the subject and it's very hard to tell where it starts. Something like that, bidirectional you can call it. So it's Absolutely. a little bit that, uh, and this is weird, you could say that the subject and the object is created in the collapse of the uh, of the uh, hyper, uh, superposition, uh, and it, it it goes as well as I, I mentioned in one lecture I made in the afternoon. Here is inspired by the citations you sent me, Kalle, because I I was already thinking about having those subjects today. But one thing is that. The, the division between uh, subject and object is an arbitrarily one. And therefore, uh, it's also, uh, sort of speak, arbitrary when you say that the subject observes the, the object or uh, vice versa, or is the object that observes the, the subject. Because there is a simultaneity there. It, mm. it, it, it it's like a happening, more or less. You mean, it, it, something yeah, happens. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a better that's more accurate. term than, than observation, then happening, yeah, like, yeah, and, um, and that happening uh, collapses the superposition and subject object mm. uh, occurs or something, yeah, sort of, sort of occurs. They, 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 they don't try to from how do you say they get they, they, they're coming forward, uh, uh they, they're being a little bit uncovered, 
but not completely. They're not firmly established, but they, they're becoming uncovered. And uh, I have to add to, uh, there's another discussion I had the other day. Uh, uh, I don't know who, who that was, but uh, it, it, it could have been you, Henry, but uh, uh, we were talking that these things could all, no, it wasn't you. It was, uh, it was uh, my Danish friend. And he said that those things can only be understood mathematically. And mm. what Bohr is trying to do, he's trying to put into words, extremely good, it's very eloquent, what he discovers in mathematics when he's looking into quantum physics. And it's very clear in mathematics that you can't say that observations start with the subject. It, it's uh, bilateral. It's... Uh, uh, bi bi-directional, it goes in the, bi uh, in the both ways. So simultaneously, uh, both subject and object are, so to speak, established, more or less. Uh, and, and of course, if you look at it in hindsight, uh, ex posteriori, afterwards, you can say, there has always been a subject. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you can say, there has always been an object. Mm -hmm. uh, which uh, Einstein always thought. Uh, he, ne he never left that. Uh, he always said that uh, that was decided from the beginning. It was always a di division going on there. Whereas Bohr said no, uh, definitely said no. And he especially said no in the conference in Solvay. You unmuted yourself, Hans. <clears throat> so... Uh, but it was um, the physician Bell who who established finally that you cannot never tell anything in, the, in advance. <clears throat> No, no, no. That's uh, uh, what John Bell discovered and uh, it's, it's uh, uh, how would you say that in English? It's permanently undecided, uh, or it was completely undecided. That the superposition is not decided in any way. No. In any aspect. Um, yes. And uh, David Bohm, he speaks about inherent, inherent ambiguity that Bohr made this discovery that there's always an inherent ambiguity in everything. <clears throat> yeah, because in, in the superposition, it is both. It is, it's, it's, uh, the cat is both alive and dead, etc. And uh, uh, maybe a bit explanatory could say that uh, when you in hindsight look at the, the thing, you see that something was undecided and then it becomes decided. And uh, you can also say in this instance, we always had two choices, wave and particle or something else. And therefore, those two things always existed. That's a, that's a really weird solution. And uh, what could that be, gentlemen? What, what would that solution be called? Determinism, what, what do you mean? Yeah, determinism. it's a sort of a determinism, but it's a special kind of determinism. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, what's his name now? Uh, uh, the one who, who uh, invented many words, uh, I forgot it now. Big Mark. Max Tegmar. No, uh, yeah, yeah, but it was another chap who-, who uh, talked the talked Previously, about. right. Um, yeah. But anyhow, uh, that's, that's how that theory started, to say that both worlds always existed, or they came to exist, and it doesn't really matter what you say, it amounts to the same thing, you have many worlds then. And uh, that's a sort of a lagom, <laughs> a Swedish mm -hmm. word meaning in between solution, in between Bohr and Einstein. Um, mm -hmm. And you can keep determinism. But you end up with a lot of extra words. <laughs> yes, yes. A lot of existences. Yeah, yeah yes. definitely. But we can say that uh, the, the idea that we don't have any free will 
or that uh, that we are um, <clears throat> that there is everything is determined from the beginning is completely false and John Bell's um, discoveries proved that we have a free will. <clears throat> yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Absolutely. So <clears throat> that, that that is proved. That, that is definitely uh, the the guy. The guy's name is Hugh Everett. He was the inventor of the many world yes, solution. Yes. Uh, uh, and that goes to show how persistent this idea of existence is. It, it's almost, I would say it's almost impossible to get rid of. But isn't it weird that uh, there are so many uh, like tribal people who doesn't have existence and they, <laughs> they cope perfectly well. Whereas we here in the Western world, we, we have such a problem coming to grips with that. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, it's frustrating for us. Uh, uh, doesn't it exist? Uh, who, who wrote that book? Uh, uh, does the moon exist if you don't look at it? Uh, no, it was Einstein who told that. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So, 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 uh, so Einstein said that. Um, uh, uh, he asked, uh, "Does the moon exist even if I don't look at it?" So his point. Mm -hmm. is, it does exist even if I don't look at look at it. It was Einstein, mm -hmm. right? Einstein. Yes. But, but it was uh, as you, you as you said, Hans, that uh, it is a pointless affirmation by Einstein. Um, mm -hmm. Is this uh, inheritance from the Greeks that we have to say if you win Schrodinger's cat, you have the cat. You have to, in order to explain the cat's existence, you have to place it somewhere. Else. Uh, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. And this is very similar to uh, Heisenberg's uh, uncertainty principle because we we both want to have an object and we want to have it uh, place in in the coordinate system in in the empty space. Mm -hmm. And uh, we get we get really angry when we can't ha can't have both. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because that, that should be that there is something wrong with the with the outer world like yeah yeah there's something wrong with the system or my belief of reality because of, of no, the outside. no no yeah it, it is quite amazing it's uh it's like quantum physics really uh turns everything in ordinary perception upside down or ordinary thinking maybe i should say Mm. Uh, uh, you have it, I, I was thinking about observation. Yes, you could say perhaps that uh, how is how how should we, we do with a blind person? But we are here speaking about uh, observation the, uh, in the proprio-centric way, as you has uh, you have spoken about proprio-centrism earlier. So it means that we have five six senses. And Hans, you are unmuted yourself. <clears throat> and so, so that there is observation that is higher observation that is the proprio-centric one, which is more uh, significant. Yeah. And so Hans, you have to repeat yourself. You disappeared. <clears throat> um, so. Yeah. So when we speak about observation, we should think not about in a physical uh, way, uh, like a plan one. Plan one does also have observation, but obs observation proprio-centric way. That is, we have observation in a higher sense, um, since also plan uh, people have observation in pro in the proprio-centric way. We have five, six senses. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's very good because uh, all those things come in part because we perceive uh, a lot more than we are aware of, and uh, uh, the conscious part, or at least the modern Western conscious part, which is very much uh, very much smaller than uh, would you compare to a tribal person, uh, that perception is extremely limited, and uh, uh, it it sort of goes hand in hand with the idea of objects. So 
you can say that that limited consciousness is manipulating objects, the constructs, and try to put them together and put them in causal order to make some sort of solution or some progression of events and also making predictions on this and whereas we we have a uh, like 98 97% of the percep perception proprioception kinesthesia all those things is not coming up to the uh, uh the conscious side of our uh, uh system so we perceive things and you could say that that perception that we're not aware of establishes the world much clearer than the idea of objects. Because for one thing, those tribal people, uh, they can find uh, uh, traits in nature that we can't see. They can, they can find animals. They can know about the food and everything that we don't have uh, the perception to do. Uh, so... We're not, we're not losing a part of reality by giving up objects. We, we, we are gaining a lot. We're gaining quite incredibly a lot more. Because the difference is, is just astounding when we compare West, modern Western people to what the perception is uh, in uh, nomadic people, for instance, in the Kalahari Desert. Uh, and uh, it, it, it is a little bit like objects they are a very lousy proxy, like a, a, a prosthetic for, a, for the world. And we have to make do with those things. And they're not working quite well. And uh, weirdly enough, the message came from physics and no other area of human knowledge. But when it came uh, with Niels Bohr and Heisenberg and Schrodinger, it came very decisive, very clear. Uh, after him, it's no doubt that existence is uh how would how would one say uh, uh a null nil property as a property that doesn't mean anything it doesn't have any effect on the world so to speak mm. Mm, 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 mm. Mm. yes so we have to uh when um, bohr speaks about observation we have to understand it in a higher level on a high level um, oh yeah 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 definitely yeah definitely because uh, even because... blind people have observation but it's in a higher sense mm -hmm. a different way yeah uh, uh, yeah it's very good Kalle, because that uh, that you said now that can help people who think uh, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody knows about it uh, it hasn't fallen and people start thinking about tree in their neighborhood trees in their neighborhood that have fallen the thing is you know a lot more than you think so <laughs> mm -hmm. a lot more and you know about these things you, you know maybe about uh, millions of trees i don't know because you also have quantum perception there that's coming up now so mm. uh, uh, when when uh, Einstein says that, does the moon exist when you don't see it? Uh, of course, uh, we have indirect perceptions of the moon. We can see, we, we can see it glittering in, in water. Uh, we, we, can, we can have the feel of uh, uh, ebb of load. How, how do you say that? Flood and uh, an ebb in, in the water. High flood uh, and low, low ebb, I think. Yeah, tide, tide and flood, yeah, something like that. And, and you can feel it in your body. Man, many people uh, of tribal nations they can feel in their body if, if, if the moon is full or not. They don't have to look at the moon to see it specifically. And this is extremely interesting. That's probably a, a material for a whole, whole other discussion. But I myself, is, uh, I'm extremely fascinated with the Renaissance. And uh, when you see what people did with their own bodies, with their hands, with their observation in those times, uh, it's just astonishing. It, you, people can't do this today. And uh, somehow with the advent of objects and uh, this new thinking, the modern thinking, the technological thinking, uh, we lost a lot of those perceptions. Uh, we, we lost the implicit knowledge of the world. And uh, in the end, the only thing we have left are the objects. And uh, 
if Niels Bohr is so mean to take away the objects from uh, Einstein, he, he gets uh, scared somehow. It's so scary. Well, it does mm -hmm. to me sometimes too. If if I wake up early one morning and I don't feel grounded and I'm out to lead and people say to me, the world doesn't exist, it's scary, of course. But the thing mm -hmm. is, actually, we used to have a much greater perception of everything in the world. And, uh, and then we haven't even started to talk about quantum perception, which is coming up now in neurology, uh, so, so to speak. And we know about birds like uh, the, the robin who, who actually navigates on quantum effects. Uh, and not things that are, what would we say, real. Uh, it uses the superposition to navigate. It's, uh, I think the world is much more fascinating than Einstein thought. It's much broader. It has its roots everywhere. And it's like a weave. It's, it's like a weave that's interconnected. And in this interconnectedness, uh, we, we can we can find loads more information knowledge than we ever could with this uh, uh, proxy objects or this subject object division uh, and many many other things of course that are sort of interconnected uh, in different way. I was thinking about that Einstein quote, uh, quotation about the moon. Um, uh, in fact, the uh, moon gets its light from, from the sun. Yeah, and uh, so to say, uh, so the moon exists. If we speak, I uh, use that word uh, thanks to um, thanks to it. So to say, observing the uh, sun. If you get my point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a way, yeah, uh, yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and. Uh, Something similar uh, Bohr is trying to express, or, or, or not only trying, he does it very eloquent, that uh, we cannot, when we look into the mathematics, say that uh, it's the subject that, that observes the object, the electron, or whatever it is. Uh, the opposite goes, uh, you, you can change those positions in mathematics without a problem, and actually that's a predisposition to do the math, that you can do that. And that, that's also very, very interesting. Mm. Henrik, any finishing thoughts? No, I mean, it's just the, the I, I think a, a lot of videos out there and YouTube and everywhere, and there is this talk about observation, and, and, I, um, and it's often very synonymous with seeing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, very good. And um, it's not about that, rather, it's a, it's a happening or, or some that there is a consciousness present or something, rather. Yeah. yeah. Um, where, where, yeah perception, where, where perception happens. Mm -hmm. Very good. It's, it's a bit more than, because, uh, yeah, it's very good, Henrik, because part of the problem in understanding or accepting this is that we equalize observation, observation with vision, and we all often use the Greek uh, idea of observing passively, and then you <laughs> then you have a lot of problems. Mm. <laughs> then it doesn't make sense anymore. <laughs> that makes it impossible to accept. Very good concluding thought, Henrik. Very good. Uh, exactly. As an observation is seeing, and seeing is already having this idea that being a separate object and. Uh, it's not that what it's, ab it's about. So uh, it's a very good concluding remark, yeah. Henrik. Uh, excellent. But we could also maybe next time talk about memory then, because I don't see uh, all the perceptions we have done or something is like in the library of, of perceptions or something. Is it right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So we, we're not conscious of it, but there is like a. <laughs> it's oh, almost yeah. like when yeah. I listen to yeah. YouTube that there is some kind of memory of everything that has has happened then mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. yeah 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 there's a memory out there 
it's a memory that's in the material world as well in the subject, uh, obviously, in that case. And mm. maybe this also helps. This is the last thought. I, we, we should have concluded there, but uh, this can also help even more to understand Federer and his uh, uh, playing tennis because it's when you don't make a distinction between uh, the subject and the ball, it, it, uh, and then in afterhand, in, in hindsight, you make, you make that distinction ex posteriori and say, Federer is the subject and the ball is the object, or something like that. All right. And, we have uh, to finish now because we, 